Hey guys, Chris Williams, REI here, real estate investor out of Central California. And man, do I have something special for you today. I just wrapped up an interview with my friend, Steven Libman, and uh, boy, you are not going to want to miss this. Steve went from wholesaling and flipping maybe a dozen deals a year for several years, joining a mastermind, growing that business to somewhere around 150 deals or so uh, a, a year, right? 10 to 20 deals a month. And then really coming to a place a few years ago where he realized that's not really what he wants to do. He wants to focus on building generational wealth and get his time freedom back to spend more time with his family and do what he loves. We go over his journey, how he started, how he grew, and you know, really what made him decide to step away from wholesaling to now acquiring a hundred $50 million worth of commercial assets here within three years. And I know he acquired more because he sold a lot as well this year. So man, you don't want to miss this. Before we start, like the video, subscribe, and let's get into it. Are you a wholesaler, flipper, or real estate agent looking to grow your business quickly with more motivated sellers or cash buyers? Then you have got to check out the seven day free trial to PropStream using the link below. With PropStream, you can run comps, find motivated sellers like people going through bankruptcy, divorce, back taxes, vacant properties, pre-foreclosures, and so much more. You can run comps, look at market data. You can even save lists, skip trace them, send out marketing right there at the click of a button. It is something that me and my team use every single day of the week, and we are getting deals out of it every month, and you can too. So again, grab that seven day free trial to PropStream below. Hey, what's up, guys? So today I have uh, my friend and special guest, Stephen Libman. Uh, I met Stephen, I think, back in 2018. Uh, we were in a mastermind together. I think I met you somewhere in Baltimore and maybe San Diego, something like that. And um, Steve, thank you so much for giving your time today. I think um, my listeners, my viewers, are and um, you know, Facebook group members are going to get a lot of value out of this because I just I love your story of where you were. Uh, how you grew this big wholesale operation and then coming to a place of realizing that that is not what you want. You want to do something yeah. for your family. You want to build wealth. And so, Stephen, if you could just kind of take a minute, give us an overview, how you started, where you started, real estate in general, wholesaling or flipping, whatever you were doing. And then also, if you could dive into coming to that realization of realizing that where your business was was really not where you wanted to be, even though you were successful by all means. I mean, I know you were, you know, over 100 deals a year, which I think almost anybody who wholesales wants to be there. So I know, um, you know, I reached out to some some high level friends of mine and I was like, hey, this is who I'm interviewing, what kind of questions you would have. And some of them were like, why would you quit, right? And uh, yeah, I think maybe- A lot of people have asked. Yeah, question. yeah, I mean, yeah. even I had that question, but I think me coming to a, place, a, a point where I told you earlier, really thinking about my family, wanting to build gener generational wealth and not just transactional money, I kind of understand where you were. I'm like, dude, I, I understand your story. And so we've got to share it here. Steve, you could take a few minutes, kind of tell us tell us that overview. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me come on. Yeah. I uh, always appreciate you know getting to spend some time. It's great to reconnect. Yeah, because, totally. Yeah, it's been it's been four years now since we yeah has initially been. met. Yeah. And I always tell people like you know entrepreneur years are like dog years, right? So four <laughs> years is like <laughs> feels like twenty five. Oh years my ago. gosh! Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, like drastic changes in the last four years absolutely um so we've been in business for 10 years i was a real estate agent first okay and i was um uh, actually i've told the story a few times but i actually reconnected with the guy who i fired as a client who made me quit being a realtor <laughs> because i wanted to yeah. thank him because he really helps give me the violent shove into owning my own business. Yeah. So, you know, story was I was a realtor. I was finding good deals uh, off, you know, on market deals mm -hmm. for bank owned properties and things like that for other investors. So I didn't want to do the retail side of that business. So I was working with investors. And uh, yeah, this guy, I made him, you know, a couple hundred grand in profit that year by mm -hmm. finding him some good deals. And at the closing table, he said that, uh, the pool ladder was missing. It was like a two hundred and eighty dollar pool ladder, and he wasn't going to close without it. <laughs> and I mean, it was this like Mexican standoff over this yeah. ladder. So he wanted me to pay for it to take it out of my commission, and I did. And that was the day that I decided not to work for anybody else anymore. Anyway, so we we started wholesaling. We did our first deal back in. 2011 so we just celebrated with the team because we've been in business for 10 years now and that's a um, 
it's a pretty interesting achievement when you get to 10 years. Only 4% of businesses make wow. it to the 10 year mark. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, so we celebrated a little bit, but the business is vastly different. So we started uh, wholesaling. We did maybe three or four deals our first year. The next five years was us trying to figure it out. This was before, not before podcasts, but before mm -hmm. I really found them. Right. Yeah. So like I wasn't, I, I was an entrepreneur on an island with my business partner. We did not have any mentors s speaking into our lives. This is like before the growth mindset even took hold in totally. us that we should get around people that are doing better than us. Like yeah. <laughs> what a simple thing to do, right? Find yeah. other people that are successful at what you want to do and replicate it. And we didn't for five years. So our mm -hmm. top year was 2000. 15 or 16 and we did like 15 or 16 deals that year yeah. a mix of flips and mm -hmm. wholesales but it was a grind right it was me and my partner i mean we were just joking about this the other day where we were at the house at 11 o'clock at night scraping razor blade <laughs> windows you know to get yep. the paint off of the windows and travis went to home depot three times during that flip in one day and wow. he called me up and he was like dude something's got to give like i don't think we're doing this business right mm -hmm. You know, like we were making, we basically built ourselves a little job, right? We were the entrepreneur, the typical entrepreneur that builds themselves a job versus a business. And then we got into that mastermind, right? And we saw yeah. other people that were scaling and doing a hundred deals a year and trying to figure out systems and processes and getting over our fear of hiring people. And then, yeah, we, we, we made it, right? We became a successful wholesale and flip <laughs> business. And then overnight, huh? Yeah, overnight. And then we realized like, and I'm sure if you're listening to this, maybe this has happened to you. Um, we built the wrong business. Mm -hmm. We didn't build the business that we thought we wanted. Like we, and, and not to take anything away from wholesaling and flipping because we wouldn't have made it to the commercial world. So in the last three years, we shut down that business and we've gone all commercial, yeah. right? So we have about $150 million in assets under management. We're looking mm -hmm. to acquire another $200 million in assets this year. You know, so we went from a very highly taxed transactional business to more long-term wealth building concept. It's still active in the sense that we are on the active side of the business, right? We have passive investors, but we're more on the active side, but it's you know, you do four deals a year, mm -hmm. right? Not a hundred. And we don't pay taxes, right? I posted my tax return <laughs> online the other day. It's like negative $400,000 this year. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So, I mean, we were paying 50% between federal and yeah. state when we were flipping houses because that's how the tax code is written for that business. And once we read a book, Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright, who's Robert Kiyosaki CPA, by the way, tax-free wealth changed the, changed the paradigm, right? We had a paradigm shift of saying, so instead of the IRS and the tax code being like a boogeyman that's gonna jump out at you and potentially lock you up in prison because you didn't pay your taxes, mm -hmm. it's a playbook, right? And if you play by the rules, you get significant tax benefits. So yeah. now we changed how we looked at it and said, okay, so what does the tax code incentivize you for? And it's typically owning businesses and owning real estate, not flipping or wholesaling, right? So. <laughs> So once we started doing that, now you get to, I mean, now we get to keep way more of our money, right? And now, um, and now we get to put that money to where we want it to go versus uh, giving it into, you know, the, um, the hands of the government who has historically not been the most fiscally sound investment. Nope. Right. So now we give a lot of money through our donor advised fund versus having to pay massive taxes. So it's just okay. understanding how those things affect your business and how you can pay less in taxes legally and then mm -hmm. we were like ah totally where in your business were you at that point where you realized that you know wholesaling wasn't really going to be that long-term play i mean what what did your business look like as far as yearly transactions staffing uh, marketing yeah. overhead that kind of stuff we were doing anywhere between 10 and 20 deals a month um, okay. we were spending sixty five thousand dollars a month in marketing yeah um, we were dropping, I don't know how many mailers that relates to, right? We didn't really do more than like two or $3,000 a, a month in uh, pay-per-click. It was mostly mailers and we mm -hmm. had uh, two full-time lead managers, maybe three, uh, two full-time acquisition managers, a full-time disposition manager, a transaction coordinator. So we got up to about 10 employees and we were doing wow. over, you know, over a hundred deals a year. Yeah. Um, some months we did 20 deals and man, it just, that business is such a, at scale, such a cash yeah. eating machine. Right. Yeah. And so part of the, the benefit of scaling was that we kind of got to see both sides of it. I think we scaled too fast. I think we 
spent too much money you know, putting money back into the business versus taking profits off the table. And I think a lot of us do that as you're trying to scale and you justify the scale, you justify the fact that you're burning all this money because you're trying to scale yeah. when in fact, you know, what you should be doing is maybe scaling more responsibly mm -hmm. and taking profits off the table along the way. I would do it differently if I had to do it all over again. And then that's what kind of gave us this decision. We did our first commercial project. It was a 180,000 square foot ground up construction uh, of a self storage complex in Orlando, wow. mm -hmm. Florida. Yeah, our first deal was a $12 million deal. We raised 4 million bucks for it. It was like a heavy lift, but we had a lot of people in the space that were already lending us money for mm -hmm. our flips. When we were telling people, hey, you can come and invest over here, you'll get similar returns, but there'll be massive tax benefits. They were like, okay, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, and we did one deal like that. And then I was like, you know, I'm not a fan of straddling two boats. It always ends with you getting wet. So we just <laughs> had to, we had to pick, right? Yeah. And this was a very big decision because at the same time, I had courted my brother-in-law away from the Navy mm -hmm. where he was a civilian contractor, probably the most stable job out there, right? He was uh, mm -hmm. he was doing system engineering for the Navy. I was courting him to be our COO of our wholesale business. The week he quit at the Navy to come over, we switched the business model. <laughs> After two years of like courting him about the business model, smart guy, he saw the light and we, he understood what we were doing. But we had to chop everybody down, right? We had to fire everybody and then we just <clears throat> decided to build this business, go raise capital, find deals, do deals. Um, and focus more on the commercial. Now, let me ask you something, because I know, at least back when we were in the mastermind together, 2018, 2019, I know the, the talk of the town for people who had kind of reached that level was getting a COO and allowing the owner to step back and kind of focus on bigger and better things. So, I mean, what, why didn't you guys just continue on with the COO, allow him to run it? you know, in a sense, almost fund your other business or, or fund your lifestyle so that then you can go acquire the tens of millions of dollars. Um, why yeah, you the, the real reason was because I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, I know that that sounds like a kind of cop out answer. But you know, there's a guy, there's a guy, a buddy of mine, uh, his name is Sharon, he had a $3.4 billion exit. And we had a conversation and he said, um, Well, why are you doing this? And I said, I could give you a bunch of reasons. I said, but he goes, but the real reason is that's just because you want to do it that way. And I said, yeah. He goes, that's perfectly okay. He's like, I don't think mm -hmm. enough people give that answer because I wanted to. Totally. Now, <laughs> logically speaking, right? I was like, okay, I'm going to have to bring Sean on. I'm going to have to train him everything about this business, right? It's going to take six months to 12 months. Easy. He has no yeah. real estate background. Mm -hmm. So to create all the systems and operations and all that stuff, how much could, how far, far could I get down the road on the commercial space in a year versus wow. training him versus, you know, and and that was the the real reason where I was like, by the time I get you ready to release you into this where you're 100% autonomous, I'm gonna be, I, I could maybe acquire another, and I just said like maybe one or two deals. We actually acquired mm -hmm. six more deals wow. right, in that year. So like, you know, it was just focus. I think lack of focus, right, especially from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I think is a, is a business killer. Like Absolutely. I, need to like one of my hurdles one of my growth points over the years was how do i become hyper focused on one thing not get distracted mm -hmm. sit down think about things and, and focus on them intentionally and i just knew if we were going to try to install a coo that it wasn't going to be a light switch right i've learned enough <laughs> yeah. over the time being in business that nothing happens as fast as you want it to yeah so to bring on a coo and frankly and you know this is not an, uh, this is not a popular opinion um, especially for the guys that run masterminds, but <laughs> I haven't seen anybody effectively do it, wow. right? I've seen maybe one guy, right? I guess one or two guys in the whole space that mm -hmm. I have seen remove themselves as an owner and have a COO actually running the business on the day to day. I haven't really yeah, seen Yeah, maybe a you? couple. I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I think a lot of guys talk about where their business is. You know, people don't always share the day-to-day -day struggles um, or the fact that they're still, you know, they may have a COO, but they're still operating as a daily CEO. Right. So anyway, so that was our decision. We just decided like, hey, and we had this um, acquisition fee that we took mm -hmm. from our first deal, which was large. 
And we said, this could insulate us, right? This We could pump this back into the cash eating machine, right? At $60,000 a month. Or we can kind of cut bait and have a little bit of a cushion and go find our next deal and focus totally. on that. And we just decided like, you know, I mean, our net worth over the seven years that we were wholesaling and flipping houses, frankly, moved incrementally. I did not become a millionaire in that business, yeah. right? We were doing millions of dollars in transactions and we were running millions of dollars through the business. Me and my business partner did not become millionaires in that business. In 18 months in the commercial business, we did. It's just a game I don't blame you just slamming that door and moving on. I mean, because I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. You can't focus that attention on two things. You're going to fall on one or fall on, on another or you're just going to fall down in water and both will crash. So, man, I feel you yeah. on that. And, and I think that is an amazing answer. And I love what you said. Really, you said because you didn't feel like it. You didn't want to do both, so you didn't do it. And, you know, I think for me as an entrepreneur, I struggle with that all the time of like, in a way, I feel this social pressure of like how my business is supposed to look, the things that I'm supposed to do, right? The time of day I'm supposed to wake up and, right. you know, work out and do this and do that and go to these meetings and that meetings. And, but quite frankly, I have to put my foot down and say, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't have to do that, right? I mean, that's part of the reason why I got into business in general, whether it's real estate or just business as a whole, is because I want a different lifestyle and I want a level of happiness and comfort. And if I'm living my life according to what everybody else wants or expects out of me, I'm never going to hit that no matter what I'm hitting financially, right? because right. every day I'm waking up and I'm doing what other people want. Um, yeah. So I, I love that, man. Kudos to you. So you, this has been what, about a three year journey for you? Yeah, just about three and a half okay. years. Well, so I mean, 150 million under management. What does that portfolio look like? You know, is it split 50 50 between storage and multifamily, or what is? We what sold all of like our today? storage uh, oh, wow. this year, mm -hmm. so we sold that uh, maybe for 50 or 60 million bucks okay. total. Right, that's not what we made on it, but it was um, it was a good exit for the first deal. So we packaged up three facilities that we put together and wow. built. So we built about 350,000 square feet, all said mm -hmm. and done, um, all managed by CubeSmart. We got them up and running and then we sold them. That was a successful turn and exit. And then now we have about under a thousand units of multifamily. We're about to build a hundred units in Charlotte, ground up. We did just buy a $30 million student housing complex uh, in okay. December that I forgot nice. about. <laughs> I just kind of forgot. <laughs> 30 right. million, yeah, it's over there, yeah. <laughs> so funny. Um, awesome, yeah, so it's a, it's a good mix. Like, So we're starting a fund, we're launching a fund this uh, this month. Okay. And wow. the fund mandate will be a little bit opportunistic uh, in so much that we will go after four separate asset classes. Okay. Um, we like the senior housing space. We're bullish on that long term because you have more baby boomers retiring um, in the next 10 years than are walking mm -hmm. the planet. So like yeah. you have a big senior housing shortage coming. Oh, so yeah. we like the, the metrics on that. It's a little bit different of a business because you have nursing and uh, memory care associated mm -hmm. with it. So you really need uh, strong operators. So the fund will fund strong so, operators. So you're looking at senior housing from the aspect of not just the real estate, but the business in general, not just providing the property? Yeah, exactly. So there are some uh, third party operators that will come in and lease out from you. But there's really strong operators that, you know, they, they kind of run they're It's like a third party property management company, but they need additional insurances and licenses and things like that. Okay. And um, yeah, I think it would be cool to be able to provide, you know, safe, stable housing for seniors that Absolutely. are maybe coming into some memory care issues or some nursing yeah. issues. Because what people aren't talking about in that space specifically, not to go down the rabbit hole real quick, but our population's declining, right? Mm -hmm. So like you have, and this is a worldwide problem where, especially in China, where they had single kid households, um, but you, you know, you're the anomaly, right? With five kids in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, my brother-in-law has six. My wife is the youngest of seven. That's, that's anomalous now. Like mm -hmm. most people have one or two kids. Well, the problem with one or two kids, right, is that they have four grandparents that are going to mm -hmm. age out or four parents that are going to age out. And now you have the burden on one or two kids for four parents and maybe wow. eight grandparents. So they, they used to take grandparents in, right? Like, yeah. oh, I'll go live with my kids. Not anymore. So the senior housing space, especially with memory care, is there's too big of a burden on the families for them to take people into their homes. Yeah. So they're putting them into uh, nice, more assisted care facilities, um, and there's a huge shortage of it. So 
anyway, I think the metrics on that speak from themselves in terms of how many people are retiring and where where our age, uh, like we're, we're living longer, right? Yeah. And retiring about the same age. So some mm-hmm. people retire maybe 67, 68, but so senior housing, student housing, multifamily and self storage will be the four wow. asset classes that the fund will be allowed to invest in. So we'll see. I mean, those are the, we like those, the metrics and all of those uh, types of properties. And really it's just about interviewing strong operators. So, uh, you know, another part of the genesis of this business was after we built three self storage facilities, we decided to go out on our own and we bought, bought a 66 unit and an 84 unit and 120 unit mm-hmm. complex that we were the operators, right? We were the owners and the operator. The three storage facilities, we partnered with an experienced okay. guy. Then we decided to become operators. That's a whole different business too, right? Mm-hmm. Asset management, property management is very different than going out and acquiring and raising money. You know, we, we took some lumps in the beginning of those deals because we didn't necessarily know how to execute on a plan for asset management. After those three deals, we said, well, our secret sauce is really that we are good at raising capital. Right? We have a book of investors. We like talking to people about this stuff. We like giving them the opportunity to invest in things that are different. So why don't we just be that? Why don't we just be the money? Why don't we just create a fund where people can invest and diversify through all of the assets that we purchase in that year mm-hmm. and build really strong sponsor relationships, co-sponsor mm-hmm. relationships, where these guys have 20, 30, 40 years in the business, have gone through many market cycles, and they have a built-out asset manager, p- property management plan, things like that. Yeah. And now we just partner with them and we manage the investors, we manage the operator, right? And we have we have 50-50 control of the property just like the operator does. Okay. And that's how we have unlimited deal flow. Like we have mm-hmm. more deals than we can fund currently. Wow. And it's a great problem to have and not one that is uh, normal in this market, right? Everybody mm-hmm. says how hard it is to find deals. I turned down $250 million worth of deals last quarter that I could have wow. funded that penciled on the back of the back in the napkin, just we didn't have <laughs> the capital capacity for it. Yeah. But we're solving Good. for that. So the portfolio that you guys have right now, that is through uh, syndication? Yeah, so we syndicated. Okay. And that word is you know probably a little bit confusing for maybe some of your audience. It simply mm-hmm. means many hands make light work. Okay. Right? You have a bunch of people that all invest together. And because you invest together, instead of you being able to afford a single family house or a duplex, you can execute on the $42 million, 384 yeah. unit that we just bought. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So that's, that's simply what it means. You raise money from a bunch of different people and mm-hmm. they invest as part owners alongside of you in the, uh, okay. in the deal. So when you go acquire a deal through syndication, are you able to do that with your say your current LLC or corporation, or are you having to go out and form an entirely new entity and and bring on partners that way? We form new entities at every property. So the fund will be a little bit different because the fund will have its own entity, and then the Mm -hmm. fund will invest as a limited partner. Right. Okay. So let's say we wow. have to raise $10 million into a $40 million deal. The fund will stroke the $10 million check. They will be the limited partner. Okay. Right. So it's just, um, it's just an easier way to account mm-hmm. for us. And it, it does a couple of things for the investor. Right now, historically, the investor has come in and said, okay, Steve, yeah, we're going to invest in this deal with you, which is fine, but it's not diversified in and of itself. Right. They're only in one deal with me. And it's yeah. not that that I, I believe that multifamily especially is diversified through the number of units at the building. Right. So if you have mm-hmm. 300 units, you're diversified in that you have 300 different tenants. But to further diversify and to further mitigate risk, we like the idea of a fund because they can invest in the fund. That fund, uh, your shares basically are spread through everything that we purchase in that okay. calendar year. So one, it mitigates your risk. Two, it allows for a more, trying not to use like technical terms, but it basically puts you on equal footing with everybody else with the cost segregation and the depreciation. Okay. So like if some, some buildings depreciate better in year one than others, right? So let's say you put $100,000 into the into a deal with us and maybe you got a $25,000 write-off as a K-1 mm-hmm. loss that year. Good. But we had another deal that got $40,000 as a K-1 mm-hmm. loss, right? Because we had more CapEx or whatever that we were doing in that year. Well, now what this does is it aggregates it through every deal that we've done that year. So now everybody okay. gets the same level of depreciation. So it it makes it a little bit more equitable uh, and fair for the investors. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what I really like about it is you can do what they call a DRIP, which is a direct reinvestment program. The dividends that we're paying out monthly, 
those folks can reinvest directly into the fund on a monthly basis if they don't want the cash flow, right? So some people invest for cash flow, some people invest for just mm -hmm. long term. And what that does is it gives them a compounding effect, right? So okay. they get to, yeah. so now they get to use the power of compound interest from their monthly dividends going right back into the fund. It helps us because we're constantly raising money from even the money that we're paying out to the investors. Yeah. And yeah. they get an aggregate, it's almost two and a half percent more per annum over a five year mm -hmm. period of time because of the Absolutely. compound. With syndication, I mean, I think not just syndication, but I think I think this kind of applies to all commercial real estate, if, if I'm not mistaken, or bigger deals. Why is there such a massive amount of depreciation when you purchase a property? Like, why is there that big? Someone invests a hundred grand and they get a twenty-five to forty thousand dollar write-off. Why is that? So the IRS tax code allows you to depreciate a building over time, right? Residential, yeah. I believe, is what thirty. 27 and a half years or something like 27 and then commercials like 39, right? A $10 million building, right? Can depreciate over 39 years. In 2017, the jobs act allowed you mm -hmm. to accelerate some depreciation. You basically do this cost segregation study, which is basically an expensive engineering report where they come out and they say, you know what? The carpets are not going to last 39 years, right? They last mm -hmm. seven. These AC condensers are not going to last 39 years. They'll last nine, right? And they basically break down every fixture in the entire building. And then they allow you to accelerate everything that um, is in like a 15-year category, 100% yeah. in year one, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I've seen guys do deals where you get 100%, almost a dollar for dollar write-off wow. because they had so much that was getting depreciated in that building. That's a step down, by the way. So over the next five years, that will diminish. It still is the best deal in town, right? It's still the yeah. best. Like Absolutely. you still don't get write-offs when you invest in any So what is deal. that typical um, debt structure looks like looks like when you do a deal? So I know you say you have to go raise capital. You know, you said what on that $12 million deal, you raised four. So I'm assuming that's from private individuals or companies. So what does that entail for the other, you know, $8 million on a deal like that? Yeah. So it varies by asset class. So like mm -hmm. the new construction, you can only get 60, 65% leverage, okay. right? So that's how we ended up raising about 30, 33%. Like multifamily deals that are cash flowing, right? You can get like 80% leverage Yeah. if, because, and, and these are all non-recourse loans, by the way. Yeah. So, you know, very different than the loans we were getting on our flips back yeah. in the day, like hard money loans are not non-recourse, right? They're full recourse. So yeah, these are non-recourse loans, Freddie, Fannie, you know, agency wow. debt. And then, yeah, we'll raise the equity. So it's anywhere between, you know, 20 and 35%. And the sponsors, ourselves and our partner will leave in about 10% of that money. So like if we're raising 4 million, about 400,000 will come from us and okay. the rest will come from investors. And the investors are structured in a preferred position, meaning we mm -hmm. can't make any money until they make their Good. returns. Okay. So is that what you call a preferred return? They get paid exactly. first? Okay. So as far as the, I would guess that would be like the institutional funds or, or that bank financing in the background, is that uh, like short-term debt, long-term, five-year, 10-year, 30-year, what does that look like? <clears throat> So it depends uh, on the deal. You know, you can, we've, on the 84 units where we had like 28 down units, we had to do a mm -hmm. bridge to perm. Okay. So we did a two year bridge loan and then we'll do a permanent financing for 10 or wow. 12 years. The 384 units we bought, it was stable. So we did 78% leverage and it was a t 12 year note, which you'll start to see right this year, um, some rates moving around. So. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, conservative guys were underwriting when they started buying these, especially in bridge loan situations, because mm -hmm. if they're going to get caught into a refinance and they didn't underwrite for you know a point or two points higher than what the current interest rates were, then you might see some guys getting in trouble. So, and that's all a virtue of underwriting, right? Like you should make sure that you're underwriting to you know slow rent growth and yeah. high interest rate growth, and hopefully it doesn't happen and <laughs> you were prepared and you get to win. But yeah, so typically we'll do like. 20 or 30 percent equity down and then try to get it especially in this interest rate environment uh fixed yeah, long term for sure so if you get 12 year financing is that amortized over x amount of time 30. or is that 30k figure 25 figured. okay yeah it depends there's some insurance companies that will amortize it over 40 years when you go to look to raise private capital are you st um, strictly stuck with accredited investors or can you get money from anybody both 
Uh, so the fund will be accredited only. All the deals that we've done in the past have been 506Bs, which is the exemption for accredited and non-accredited investors, as long as you uh -huh. don't have more than 35 of them in a deal. The caveat to that is you cannot publicly advertise those deals, right? Mm -hmm. So like you didn't see me on Facebook talking nope. about all of our deals, right? Yeah. Like you had to be invited to a webinar. You had to know us. You have to have what the IRS calls a substantive business relationship. Yeah. And, you know, you have to have financial conversations. You have to know people really well. Like you can't just meet somebody and pitch them a deal, right? You have yeah. to know them for a while. So yeah, we've done both. The fund will move to accredited so we can advertise the fund. Mm -hmm. And then we'll probably still do some one-off deals in the 506B exemption uh, with the people that we already have those substantive business relationships That's awesome. with. You said you're, you're looking to acquire 200 million this year as far as assets go. If you don't mind, yeah. I mean, how, how do you even get that? Like, are you looking for properties that are on the market? Are you guys analyzing a market and you're trying to contact individual owners? I mean, what is that plan to even get there? Yeah. So what's cool is moving from that operator to fund manager. Mm -hmm. um, operators look for deals, right? Okay. Fund managers look at operators. That's how we have the deal flow that we have, right? We're okay. underwriting deals that are already under contract, typically off market, but typically with 20, 30, 40 year operators. Wow. So those guys have deep relationships. So they're getting deals that we would never see, mm -hmm. especially once you get to like the you know, $50 million mark per yeah. deal. Like the air is pretty thin up there. There's not a lot of people <laughs> buying for the same deal. For sure. So, um, so that's how we find our deals. We have, we just have great sponsor relationships and we're always looking to expand those. We underwrite the operator first, right? First, it's gotta be a core value fit, right? And then, and then it's, do you have 10 years in the business? Do you have a thousand units under management? Do you mm -hmm. have 10 exits, right? Wow. So like, we don't fund new operators because they're risky, right? Riskier. And when you have the capital, right? The capital has the loudest voice. So you can kind of make your own rules and play by your own set For of sure. rules. That's awesome. So tell me a little about, about uh, I know you kind of briefly touched on it, you know, and I think it's kind of in, in the name of your company as well. So you kind of seem to have, it's not just business, but it's missional. You're taking part of your funds and you're putting it towards things that you believe in. I mean, do you mind kind of touching on that a little bit? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, so we say invest with purpose, right? Yeah. We, um, the name of our company is Proverbs uh, nine ten, which is the man who walks in integrity walks securely. The man who takes crooked paths will be found out. And we named our company that to remind us who we work for, not to remind other people who yeah. we think we are, right? So you know, we we love Jesus over here, yeah, and uh, we've had salvations through our business and oh, uh, some of the team members have gotten saved through this business and uh this is our ministry right so yeah. like we're marketplace ministers and mm -hmm. we believe that god has blessed us so that we can be a blessing so through some prayer you know i w i wanted to we were seeking god on like how do we give more abundantly now before we make it there right the Absolutely. quote unquote there yeah. what, what is the there number everybody has their own there well when i have a million dollars in the bank i'll be able to give more abundantly <laughs> But that's not what God calls us to do, right? Yeah. Like the, the woman at the well didn't give mo the most. She gave the least probably, but it was the yeah. most to her. So we were just trying to figure out like, Lord, how do we start giving more abundantly now mm -hmm. before we make it there? And the answer is super simple. It was like, just partner with me on every deal, right? Oh. So the first deal we did, we gave 1% away to, um, to a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm. So 1% of the cash flows, 1% of the upside, just 1% of the general partnership essentially was going to flow to this nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And then we did 2% on the next deal. And then we did uh, 8%. The last deal we did was 20% of total cash wow. flows and upside will go to a nonprofit, which becomes staggering numbers with the size mm -hmm. deals that we're doing, right? Absolutely. So, and it's, it's amazing because, you know, we exhort the team to give till it hurts. Blessings just continue to chase us down, right? Deal flow Absolutely. continues to chase us down. People partner with us because they have a like-minded vision where it doesn't affect their returns, but on a monthly basis, they find out what we're doing around the world with their partnership, right? So, and not every investor obviously is a Christian that invests with yeah. us, but they still like the missional kind of attitude that we have about saving girls from sex trafficking in the Philippines and digging wells yeah. in Western Africa and, mm -hmm. you know, feeding tens of thousands of people in Thailand. So now, you know, we just, our BHAG, right? I don't know if you heard the term BHAG. Yep. You're listening to this. audacious big. goal. Yeah. That's right. So like your BHAG doesn't have to be uh, a timeline, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just what is the goal? What's the big goal? And our big goal 
is to give 80% of the net profits of this business away wow. every year. So <clears throat> that means we'd have to make a lot of money, right? Because 20% to <laughs> cover overhead and all that. But that's our BHAG, right? The whole mm-hmm. team knows that that's the BHAG. And now we have a donor advised fund, the Invest with Purpose fund that, you know, all that kind of flows through, through uh, an organization called NCF, National Christian Foundation. They, mm-hmm. they are probably one of the largest third party donor advised fund platforms mm-hmm. out there. And it's cool because they do the vetting for you, right? If you have a nonprofit that you want to give to, they go make sure all their paperwork's up to date and they do the background checks and all that good stuff. And it makes it really simple to track your giving. If you, if you give to charities in general, you know, they send you these things at the end of the year, right? That you probably yeah. lose. Yeah, right. So if you're me, you lose them all. And then yeah, you don't I, get just, the... <laughs> I just downloaded mine yesterday. I was like, oh, we're like almost, you know, almost February. I got to get these. Right. And, you know, and then you forget where you gave to like another missionary or whatever that you, just, yeah. you forgot about. Anyway, so this is cool because you can do this for your family too. You can set up a donor advised fund through your family and then you can print that off at the end of the year and you just have one statement where every, mm-hmm. where it tracks all of your giving. Oh, all, all your tithes too, if you do it that way. So yeah, so now one of our team members, Celia... She spends four to six hours a week just on the donor advised fund, just getting wow. updates from the nonprofits that we're supporting, just getting mm-hmm. videos and testimonials and stuff like that. So it's um, it's really the heart behind the business. And it's cool because I think we're encouraging other people to start doing that as well, yeah. especially in the commercial space where they start seeing that and they're like, we're being intentional about our giving, right? We're being intentional mm-hmm. about where that money is flowing through and how that goes to support the missions that we... And that is amazing. Um, I I love what you had touched on in in kind of when you started that, um, talking about that is because you said you started talking about it and asking and praying about it before you got there, right? Like you saw in the future you wanted to give big, but looking at where you were then, like how do you start now? I mean, and you know, for me as a Christian, even as a pastor, I mean, that's something that I, you know, I firmly believe it's like, if you can't tithe off a thousand, you're not going to tithe off a million, you know? And, and, exactly. and if you truly believe that giving is something that's powerful, whether it's spiritually powerful or just powerful within yourself, like you have to start when you have nothing, right? When you have 10 bucks in your wallet, a hundred bucks in, in your bank account, it's like, if you can't let go of the little, you will have an extremely hard time letting go of you know, 10,000 times more than that, you know, trying yeah. to give away a hundred thousand or, or a million. And, and I know that tithing in general seems to be kind of a success principle, even from like non-believers, there are a lot of highly successful people that, that believe in giving to nonprofits. And, and I think there's power in it even beyond uh, the spiritual blessing that comes with it. You know, I think, I think nothing holds our heart and our mind and our pride as tight as as money does especially when we've gone through the grind and and we've made a lot of money or even a little bit of money right we hold that tight and it's like this is mine nobody can touch it nobody can even talk about it or look at it this is mine so what happens is when we give obviously i do believe that there is the the, that spiritual blessing that comes but i think what happens inside of our hearts and our minds is when we're able to let go then it's like whatever pride and arrogance that was holding our heart that also gets to let go of it as well to me the the opposite or the antidote of greed is generosity. And so mm-hmm. when you have greed in your heart, when you start to be generous, even when you don't want to, even when it hurts, when it's sacrificial, what happens is, is there's no more room for greed. It starts to go out, right? That pride starts to go out. Yeah. And I mean, even stress, I mean, when you're stressing over business, but you're able to turn around and you're able to give a, give away a lot, it's like, man, this is worth it, right? I, I'm, I'm willing to go through the grind. I'm willing to go through the yeah. hustle, the, the hard months, the good months, because I know ultimately outside of myself, Somebody else is going to be blessed out of it. So I'm I'll really glad to share that. A, it's, it's created an amazing culture too, right? Yeah. Because we have a culture of generosity in the business. And like, mm-hmm. it's cool to tell the, the team like, hey, go find your local church yeah. and, and ask them if they have a benevolence fund mm-hmm. set up, right? Because we're going to give 20 grand to everybody's church wow. this month <laughs> to just let the church go be the church, yeah. right? And let them go help people in their congregation with... You know, it's it's incredible. You know, you reminded me of Matthew six twenty one, right, where it says, "For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Absolutely. Yeah. And it's humbling, right, to be mm-hmm. able. And when you, it, what's amazing too, it, so it changes your heart posture. You're right from greed to generosity. Mm-hmm. It also makes you recognize how much need there is. Yeah, like truly, we're making a dent, mm-hmm. maybe, and like you just keep seeing how much further, like how much more you can give an impact and like how many yeah. more people are in need you know we're, we're blessed in this country to even be here right yeah. to have the ability to start a business and to do mm-hmm. these things and 
you know, we're at some point you are only incrementally changing your life with mm -hmm. the additional finances that you're bringing in. Right. I mean, how much is enough, right? Yeah. And if you if you come from a place of contentment, right, and especially if you've started and bootstrapped your own business and you didn't grow into your future salary, <laughs> right? Like my wife didn't work and we lived off of pennies for so long yeah. that when we started making real money, I was like, well, I don't know what to do with this, so let's go yeah, give it away. Totally. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's um but yeah, I mean that's it's been a culture changer for us because we just have like so much focus on that for the team. Like they know what we're doing it for. Yeah. The buy in is there because it doesn't matter like what happens in the day to day, they know big picture wise. Yeah, the man, I love that. Love that. I think that's so awesome. Uh, I look forward to continuing to see you blessed and to see your business blessed. And uh, my wife and I sat down with some friends last night, and they were just sharing, you know, their desire to start a business and trying to get, uh, you know, trying to navigate that and navigate the fear of risk and and you know the fear of the low months and all that. And I was just reminded that it's always been a deep belief in me that I believe nobody on this planet is more influential or has the greater ability to impact the world than business owners, right? Because like we can hire people, we can go yeah. in and we can physically change neighborhoods. We can give away a lot of money to good organizations and to people and change lives, right? More, more so than politicians, more so than your, your average person. Yeah. No, I mean, we have an opportunity through the businesses that most people will never get and, and to be influential to the people that come and work for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, um, yeah, it's a big responsibility. And you know, so that fear is real though, right? I'm sure you're, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure your listeners are, you know, some of them go through this and we did too. It, it really was a lot of faith that got us through a lot of the, the low months and the tough times. This is a hard thing to go through, even as a Christian, where it's like the business is not my provider because yeah. you're sewing into the business as mm -hmm. if it is. And you literally see the tangible checks that come out of the business. So like during those low months to not rely on your business because that's not, where your reliance should be put yeah. is difficult. That's hard. Yeah. Like that's very hard, especially from the entrepreneur mindset where it's like our whole job is get it done. We're going to yeah. find a solution. It's a, uh, it's a growth, <laughs> it's a growth point for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah, I mean, it comes with a lot of, uh, a lot of upside too. how you can be influential and how you can. And I think it's our responsibility as business owners to do that, whether it's for your, yourself in like a marketplace ministry perspective, like mm -hmm. if that, or if it's just to just be a good boss to your people. And just, totally. you know, just be a good person and give them a good place to work. And I mean, we, we spend a lot of time helping our people achieve a more balanced lifestyle, right? So mm -hmm. like we have a daily huddle every, every um, morning mm -hmm. where we go through our 30 day, six month and one year goals for the whole team. And we just say on track, off track, what's a struggle? What are we doing? These are the, the wheel, right? Of like what we focus on. Nourishment, restoration, movement, surroundings, mindset, purpose and passion community and connection and professional growth. Yeah. So everybody has a goal attached to all of those things and professional growth is only one of them, right? So like mm -hmm. what we're talking about with our people is how are you growing in your life, not just with the business, but totally. in all these different areas and how can we support you as business owners, Yeah. right? In helping you build the life that you That's want amazing. to build. That's amazing. You know, one thing that I did starting out 2022 actually before you know trying to plan it's just like i realized and then i even heard this on uh craig rochelle's podcast like when you're setting goals it's not like don't be so focused on the what you want to accomplish but focus on who you want to become right mm. and so setting my goals this year i'm like i want to be a better husband i want to be a better father right i want to be more generous and, and a better friend you know in the business world there's so much talk about going out and grinding and you know waking up early staying late and all that but oftentimes really overlooks that personal side and i mean it, it's kind of my belief that it's like if you fail at relationships you fail at life what does it matter if i go make 10 million dollars this year but my wife leaves me because i'm never home and my kids don't remember me or, or they they don't know me and you know they miss me every day but I, you know, what if I'm out of the house before they wake up and I come home and they, after they go to bed, it's like, what's the point of making all that money if, I, if, if my own home is failing without me, right? So that has got to be my focus, my personal, my spiritual, yeah. my relationships. And if I get those in line, then when I come to the office, I'm automatically going to be better, right? Because yeah. I, I, I've focused on the most important things first and the business is just here to support that. You know, mm -hmm. Like my business is not my purpose. My, my business is just going to support my purpose um, right. and it doesn't get in front of everything else. Yeah, it's the analogy of the balls, right? Like each one of these things are a ball. One, some are rubber and some are yeah. glass. And if you drop them, you know, your relationships especially. And, you know, um, 
as you as you embark on that this year, I suggest you read um, Jim Shields' book, uh, 18 Summers. Write that down. And The Family Boardroom. Brief synopsis is we're doing dates, intentional dates every 90 days with each of our kids. Yeah, he lays it out in the book, Family Boardroom. It's, uh, it's just a real amazing way to make sure that you're connecting. Mm-hmm. And as entrepreneurs, I think we do this, uh, you know... <laughs> At least for me, I'm fairly poor at this where I'm, I try to spend like intentional time with my kids, like 10 yeah. minutes at a clip, right? Like, <laughs> yep, you got all my attention for 10 minutes and then I got to go yeah. back into the office. But this is like, these are four hour dates, intentional. Yeah. And um, so that was something that we wanted to work on this year as well is like, how do we make sure that, I mean, you only get so long with your kids mm-hmm. and once they leave the nest, you're like... What did I do, right? Did I spend yeah. the time that I sew into them the way that I wanted to? And uh, yeah, so anyway, that cool book to help us uh, focus on on the kids and your spouse too. You can yeah, do that's you awesome. Can do these type of board meetings. That's awesome. Kids. I'm gonna pick those up. So going back from from the beginning, uh, what kind of obstacles did you encounter starting out? Um, ego. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't we all thinking <laughs> thinking I knew stuff that I yeah. didn't know. Um, no, it was really, I think a lot of, you know, not taking enough time to learn the business. Like I just thought, you know, I don't know if I, maybe HGTV just did us a poor service, right. Of saying that everybody mm-hmm. could flip a house, but <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, they were self-inflicted obstacles just because we didn't know what we didn't know. Right. It, it yeah. was like the black swan effect, the unknown unknowns and they're solvable with mentorships. Right. So yeah, like there's totally. getting around like minded people to really change the game and change their net worth over time, too. Right. Mm-hmm. These guys have great pieces of advice about what to do with money and where to put money and how to invest properly. And, you know, just these different ways of thinking that wealthy people have that I didn't have when I was growing up. But, yeah, it was mostly um, just f- trying to figure out how to navigate the business landscape without any business knowledge or acumen yet. I mean, totally. I have a degree in sociology from Boston University. I don't, you know, now I run a real estate company. So, <laughs> you know, That's amazing. it's really just trying to figure out what to learn. So if to someone learn. were to want to start out, whether just commercial real estate in general or doing syndication, what would you recommend they do? I mean, I think the easiest way for us to get involved was what we did, which was partner with a mentor that had more experience and we could add some value. The value we brought was money. Uh, maybe the value that they can bring is something mm-hmm. else or pay for it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I can, I will pay for any amount of knowledge. Like yeah. it shortcuts the line, right? So like, if I can write a $10,000 check to somebody and they can sew into my life about marketing or about, you know, some other thing that I don't know about, but they really do know about it. Mm-hmm. Pay for it. Right. You're yeah. going to pay for it either yeah. way. Yeah. Right? You you're going to pay for it in mistakes or yeah. time, time spent or the money that you're gonna pay somebody else to just give you the knowledge. So, you know, I think if I could start all over again, that's what I would do. I would have probably just spent, like even when we started the mastermind that we were in, right? It was 25 Mm -hmm. grand and um, we put it on a credit card because we just didn't, and and people, you know, I know that people probably will say that that's a bad idea, but it changed our life, right? Mm -hmm. The next year we did 75 deals. The year before that we did 16. It changed the game for us because we we were action takers, right? We're implementers. So like when we heard other people doing it and we're, I think every person has this four minute mile mentality. Like once you see other people doing it, you're like, I could do that too. These guys aren't much smarter than me, right? They just know what to do. Mm -hmm. So let's go do that. So if you're getting started, you know, there's a ton of free resources like you put out, right? Great content that you put out that people can really help. Like here's the steps, right? I would say the other thing is to create an actual plan, right? Read EOS, Traction, yes. you know, some, some things like that because for five years we didn't run a business that way. I had no idea that it could be so much easier, right? Like just having the thought process and mindset to go, oh, let's think this through and implement it and chunk it down <laughs> to monthly or quarterly rocks, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then following through. You know, you nailed actions. it right there. I think there's there's a swath of information available. You know, I know there are a lot of awesome investors and syndicators and fund managers that have YouTube channels, right? And they're, or they're being interviewed on, on bigger pockets. I know for myself, even as like a fix and flipper, I'm more than willing to partner with somebody and make less, you know, if somebody brings me that value of bringing the deal, right? They, they did the work, they did the groundwork. And I'm more yeah. than willing to show somebody the steps, even if that means I make less. It's like I get the I get 
awesome, you know, I get the benefit of at least making something I wouldn't have made and I get the joy of showing somebody as well. So I can imagine, you know, I, I think our real estate industry in general, whether it's wholesaling, flipping, commercial syndication, it seems like it's very normal for people to be very giving and very open and willing to let other people come in and win with them. So yeah, I know if I wanted to, to start syndicating or even just purchasing storage or, or doing ground up, you know, you'd be one of the people I come to. There's probably several other people I'd go reach out to just because I know that that is, I don't have to figure it out on my own, right? There are other yeah. people who've gone before me. Uh, they're, yeah. they're learning, they're growing, they've been there. And I would way rather go partner with somebody and at least get a little bit of a pie than go try to figure it out on my own and spend years and, <laughs> You know, thousands yeah, and of we've dollars, done that with, I mean, there's there's other people from the mastermind that you and I were in that are partners of mine in some of these yeah. other deals now mm -hmm. where they, where we said, look, you can help us raise some capital, right? You want to learn from the inside. That's exactly what we did. And we've showed them how to start a fund. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they're on the monthly calls of asset management, property <laughs> management. They're learning from wow. the inside, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I think there's no, it's a really generous community. I think it is in general, like I was pleasantly surprised that once we start, even the mastermind that we were in, right? I mean, everybody was just such a abundance mindset, kind of go giver. And I, and I think it, for me at least, it's fun to watch other yeah, people win. I, I just love the fact that we could learn something and then implement it and then watch somebody else grow and succeed. And like, hey, we did the first two deals together, but now you're going to continue <laughs> to go do your own deals, yeah, right? Absolutely. So real quick, just my last question for you. What is your end goal here? I mean, are you looking to have a billion under management? Do you just want to exit and have a bunch of cash? I mean, what is your personal end goal here with Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the BHAG, right? The 80% of company revenue going to yeah. nonprofits. So I think we'll get to a billion under management mm -hmm. in the next three or four years, you know, which relates to about 250 million to 300 million of equity, right? The cash flow that's produced from these buildings can really change the game for a lot of nonprofits, right? Absolutely. For a lot of yeah. um, missionaries too. Like, you know, we call it, we call it a missionary that we were supporting. She's in the Philippines and she, we were like, you know, what, what's the biggest need right now? Mm -hmm. And it was a motorcycle right? For this girl to get around to pray with, you know, these women that were working at brothels. And we were like, oh man, motorcycle. Like I'm thinking like, what kind of, you know, how much is a motorcycle cost? It's like 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. And we were like, oh man, we'd love to sponsor that. And they just fell apart. I think we'll be operating in five or six years, we'll be consistently operating 40 properties. So that's okay. really the number goal is to, to own and operate a consistent 40 properties. That's like eight additions and eight exits per year after year, five wow. or six. And then, yeah, to give away 80% of the cash flows and upside that comes from those deals after the investors are paid, obviously, but for, for the business. I do consider this to be a ministry that, I mean, it just prints cash. Yeah. It's just, I mean, these when you own, when you figure out how to own and operate these deals properly, they just, you have 384 renters paying you rent every <laughs> single month, right? And yep. then your overhead is 48% and the rest goes to the investors and split between us and the, the sponsors. And so I don't see an exit plan. I think I started with that idea in mind that we were going to put maybe a billion under management and then sell all of it and sit like, you know, Scrooge McDuck on this pile of gold coins. <laughs> but it's so much deeper now, the purpose that we've that we've come to, to realize with this gift that is this business. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll ever stop, right? I just don't see an end in sight because you get to do bigger and bigger and cooler things. It's probably a different answer than a lot of people give. Like, you know, because it's not tied to a dollar amount, right? It's like yeah. how... How much can we give away? And that will be the test over the next decade or so. Like how how much can we, how fast can we get to that? I love 80%? it. Well, Steve, appreciate your time. We're just over an hour. I want to honor your time. And I know you got to get back to your kids there. <laughs> yeah, um, do you have any thoughts you want to leave with us before we shut it down? Yeah, you know, I mean, just where your focus goes, your energy flows, right? So like yep. for me, we have just been really intentional about spending some time thinking. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's not taught nearly as much as it should be. You know, Napoleon Hill's book is called Think and Grow Rich, not Be Frantic and Grow Rich. <laughs> yeah. And I think for me, at least, you know, the thing that's resonating with me the most this year is as you move from entrepreneur to business owner, the things that you think about have to be different. I wish that I was taught this earlier on because when I was building a business, I would have built a business, not a job. Mm -hmm. So you know, get those books that we were talking about before EOS and start putting out together like a business plan and things. Make sure you're spending time thinking, right? Yeah. I have 45 minutes in my calendar now every day that's just set aside 
to think. And the things that you think about can range from like, are we doing this properly? Mm -hmm. And the best time to think, by the way, is when you're sure, when you're sure you're doing something right. It's a great time (laughs) to think, right? And try to break it in your head and just be like, what if I'm wrong here, right? Because sometimes you are. And, um, and then you can go kick it around with the team. But I think we're so hyper attacked with content, and media, and social media, and those things where if you can turn it off for 45 minutes to an hour and start small, right? Start 10 minutes and take a pen to a notepad and just jot stuff down that comes to your brain. And, and like you, you, I think you'll be surprised of how much value comes out of that just intentional yeah. time thinking. So mm-hmm. super random nugget, but that's what we've been focusing on <laughs> recently. I love it. And it's, it's, got, Absolutely love it. it's got a lot of totally. value for us. Well, Steve, thank you. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? If they want yeah, to you can go you, to, you, uh, you. you can go to our website, integrityhg.com. You can sign up for the investor club and you get notifications about deals and what the fund's doing and exits nice. and nonprofit stuff. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to listen to us talk about random musings, you can go to, uh, Listen to us on Free From Wall Street. So that's the name of our we podcast. Got it. And I'll, oh, I'll link to your website as well. Awesome. Appreciate well, thank it, you so Steve. much. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you.